We are live. Great. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Business Roundtable hosted by the Maryland State Board of Education and the Maryland State Department of Education. My name is Clarence Crawford, and I serve as president of the State Board. I'm just excited to be here. I spent a career in the federal government. I was a CFO. I worked in the private sector with Deloitte Consulting and with the other another private sector firm. And I also have a nonprofit uh, in Prince George's County that focuses on helping dis primarily disadvantaged people transform their lives and become either successful employees or successful entrepreneurs. I wanna just again, thank the members of the business community that are taking time out of their schedules to be here with us. I'd also like to introduce um, Dr. Sylvia Lawson, uh, Deputy uh, Superintendent for Organizational Effectiveness. Um, and we'll have her uh, be involved in the program. Tonight, we're really gonna focus on the strategic plan. Phase one of the strategic plan, what's in it? We want to give you an opportunity to hear what's in the plan. We wanna get your reactions to the plan, help us make sure that what we're doing is on track and it's the kind of things that will really make a difference in the lives of children. We recognize that you are a consumer of our product. So it is very important that we hear your perspectives on how we're doing and are we tackling the right kinds of issues. So we have a, a wonderful group of business leaders here from a wide variety of industries and uh, geographies. So we're excited about that. Without any further delay, I would like to um, introduce uh, Dr. Lawson and uh, have Dr. Lawson uh, provide some initial information and then also Mr. Dale. Dr. Lawson. Thank you so much, President Crawford. It is indeed an honor for me to be here and representing Mr. Muhammad Chaudhry, State Superintendent. Mr. Chaudhry sincerely asked me to express his appreciation for everyone's presence here this evening. It will be an opportunity for us to share important facts about our strategic plan and information about what is planned moving forward for phase two as well as some information about phase three. I am joined tonight by Mr. Justin Dehaw, and Mr. Dehaw is the Assistant Superintendent for the Division of Financial Planning, Operations, and Strategies. Uh, Mr. Dehaw, would you like to have some remarks as well? Uh, thank you, Dr. Lawson. Uh, I will just echo your comments that it is a privilege to be here tonight, and I am eager to take part in this conversation and to hear from all of you and, and get to take that back and inform our work, so. Thank you, Justin. We know that tonight's conversation will be engaging and it is designed to give our stakeholders an opportunity to share your ideas, access some questions, and to share your thoughts about what you think is important. And at this time, Mr. Crawford, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thanks a lot, Dr. Lawson. And Mr. Dale, I want to again, thank everyone for coming. Uh, Dr. Lawson is going to walk us through the strategic plan, uh, the first phase. Again, it's, uh, we want to give you a, a better understanding of what's in the plan. Uh, we want to also give you an opportunity to ask clarifying questions. You can uh, type your questions into the chat or you can put them in Slido. And then um, we will then circle back and take those questions and give you an opportunity to have uh, questions and answer. Uh, Dr. Lawson, without any further ado, why don't we just turn it, move directly into phase one. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Crawford. Lindsay, could I get you to present the slides, please? Yes, I will do that. Um, I just need to ask uh, Dylan to um, turn off the, um, or turn on the participant screen sharing for me. And we will get those up as soon as that is switched. Thank you. 
We are all set now. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Lindsay. Tonight, I am going to share, share a short presentation and give information about our strategic plan. We have been engaging stakeholders from across the state in a variety of different ways. We have had listening sessions. We have had roundtable discussions like we are doing tonight. And of course, we had a survey that we use in order to gain information. It is important that we engage our communities. It is also important to the superintendent that we over-engage rather than under-engage. It is important that we know exactly what is important to you. Next slide, please. My presentation will be broken down into five sections. I, I am going to give you information and an induction about the strategic plan. It will include why we have a strategic plan and why our strategic plan matters. I will give you a brief synopsis of the blueprint for Maryland's future. It is a massive law. It, I am only going to summarize some of the most important parts. And then I will give you an overview of our phase one components of our strategic plan. The plan will be, uh, we are only in the first phase of the plan. We will introduce the second phase of the plan at our February 28th Board of Education meeting. And then I will give you an opportunity to share your thoughts and your ideas. Next slide, please. Lindsay, could we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. You may wonder why we need a strategic plan, and I'm sure that many of you are very familiar with the development of a strategic plan. The State Board of Education has not had a strategic plan in a very long time, and the development of the strategic plan gives the department and the State Board of Education an opportunity to reimagine the work of the State Department and that of the State Board of Education. So the State Board and the State Superintendent decided that the development of the strategic plan is extremely important. The development of the plan would allow us to make decisions about what we deem is necessary and important for student success. We know that there are many things about education in Maryland. And one of the things that we know is that the COVID pandemic had a tremendous impact on education across the state, especially for historically underserved groups. We are going to make sure that through the strategic plan, we address challenges that persist. And the one thing that we do not want to do is return to normal because even a return to normal is not good enough. Even during those times, we had gaps in the education that was provided to various groups of students. Ultimately, our goal is to achieve the blueprint. We are currently in the blueprint era because this is the time when the blueprint was developed. It is tremendously important because it is a multi-billion dollar initiative to assist the school systems across the state. Next slide, please. As you can see, our strategic plan has gone through a number of different phases. Here you will see a road that represent the path that we have used for the strategic plan. It is purposefully winding because all roads are winding in various ways. When we started the process in November, we started with a survey and ultimately began a data walk at um, the Board of Education in Washington County. Since that time, we have had five data walks. And during the data walks, we provide information to different regions across the state. Once we have completed our data walks, we hopefully will have reached every corner of the state. When we began with phase one, we wanted to revamp our mission, our vision, our values, our priorities, 
and most importantly, our enablers. On February 28th, as I have previously stated, the phase two of the strategic plan will be released, which will explain where we are going to go in the next five years to get more students prepared for success. In June, we will release phase three, which will involve identification of flagship strategies, programs, and initiatives that must be in place in order to help fulfill our goal of ensuring that every student receives a quality education that is of a national caliber. Next slide, please. Here are the elements of our strategic plan. Phase one, again, has our mission, vision, and the values that inform our work, our priorities, and the things that we will focus on to ensure success for children in K through 12 schools ensuring that they receive a quality education. The one thing that we, when you look at our foundational elements, when you see here of the strategic plan, we want to make sure that our priorities are supported and help our decision making in order to make sure that we achieve what we set out to do. The goals and metrics track progress and measure success in connection to each priority. The flagship strategies, initiatives, and programs outline the concrete work that needs to be completed to achieve each priority. Next slide, please. And I have given you a few teasers about uh, the blueprint. So let's talk about, about the blueprint. All of our work is grounded in su a successful implementation of the blueprint. The blueprint was passed by the General Assembly in 2021. There were earlier versions of it that had passed and some elements of it had passed. However, the full version of the legislation was not passed until 2021. It will provide $3.4 billion of funding over the next 10 years to our school systems. It is truly something unique and never has any state passed a law that impacts every aspect of education the way the blueprint will. So the blueprint is truly a big deal. There was a commission known as the Kerwin Commission that met for over three years to study what it would take to move Maryland's education system to the next level. The commission published the Kerwin Commission report that ultimately aided assembly members in Annapolis in crafting the blueprint legislation. All of this work revolves around five pillars and I will share what those five pillars of the blueprint are. Next slide, please. So again, this is a high level overview. I am going to take a law that is a hundred plus pages and give you just a high level view of what is in the law. So there are five pillars. The blueprint is anchored around each pillar. Under each pillar, there are specific initiatives, programs, and investment. Pillar number one in the blueprint law is early childhood education. What does that mean? It means that whether the school system is in the mountains or on the shore, that families can obtain high quality pre-K in a setting that they can afford. And it also means that making sure that the cost of pre-K is something that is obtainable, especially for families who are low income and not affiliated with any group or organization that can assist them. The next pillar is high quality and diverse teachers and school leaders. The goal is to make Maryland the place where teachers want to come and not only come, but where teachers want to remain. So we are raising the starting pay to $60,000 for teachers. And that is something that is also a big deal. Not all of our school systems are there yet, but they will get there eventually. And then we have instituted career ladders where teachers can make an additional $17,000 on top of their base salary so that they can be able to increase their salary and the pay that they receive. The state will be investing in making sure that our educational preparation programs are high quality as well. 
And the one thing that we want to ensure is that when teachers go into the classroom, that they are prepared to assist students. We are still not at a place where we need to be. Our student population is about 50% students of color, but our teachers do not look like the students in their classrooms across the board. That is important to us as well in making sure that teachers reflect the student population. The next pillar is college and career readiness. Everything that the blueprint has is tied into this pillar. It sets new expectations that students are college and career ready by 10th grade, and if not by the 10th grade, by the time they graduate from high school. The next pillar or the fourth pillar is more resources for students. More resources for students means that those areas in the state who have high poverty levels receive the dollars and the funding that they need for their schools, especially our special needs students and English language learners. And finally, the fifth pillar is governance and accountability. The whole goal of this pillar is in governance and accountability means that we are held accountable. One of the things that everyone should know is that all of the districts would have to turn in an implementation plan and that you cannot expect for the legislators to put such a tremendous amount of funding into education and not hold everyone accountable for high quality results. Next slide, please. So let's talk more about the engagement that the state board and the state department of education has been doing around the state because that is truly important to everyone as well. So let's go to the next slide. We want to make sure that we are taking a multi-pronged approach to being able to meet our stakeholders where they are. The one thing the superintendent has been adamant about is making sure that stakeholder engagement involve expanding the tent to include an increased depth and breadth of engagement. We have a community engagement team in the department that is dedicated to ensuring that we are able to engage our stakeholders well. Engagement has included surveys, community events, listening sessions, roundtables, and these efforts will not um, cease because we are, are coming to the end of phase one. As a matter of fact, we would take every opportunity to engage stakeholders even more. Next slide. We wanted to make sure that when we engage our stakeholders that we broaden the stakeholders that we engage. We have engaged outside of the school systems as well as inside of the school systems and with various organizations across the state. And here you will see examples of the groups that we have actively had engagement opportunities with. Next slide. This slide depicts what our numbers look like so far. And I would just like to remind everyone that we this is just phase one. We have conducted a survey and we have received over 27,000 responses our state, from our state, from every different region. Over 5,000 stakeholders have participated in events. And there was not always event, these were not always events that we hosted. We have also participated in 20 round tables and we have had over 307 participants and over 30 hours of dialogue with our stakeholders. And hopefully this is only the beginning. Next slide. So let's talk about some of the phases of uh, when we talk about phase one. Let's talk about some of those elements that we landed on and how we got to where we did in choosing our goals and priorities. Next slide. Again, when we look at our mission and vision statement, it applies to the entire state. You probably have seen other mission and vision statements in the state, but at the state level, we landed on the following mission and the vision, sta following vision statement. And I'll give you an opportunity to, to read our mission and our vision statement. 
And as you review our mission and vision statement, I want you to keep in mind that our vision statement is that we will have a system of world-class schools where students acquire the knowledge and skills necessary to succeed in college, career, and one of the things that I believe is most important and in life. Let's go to the next slide. These are the values that we landed on. You can see them here. The values are around accountability, engagement, equity, excellence, and transformation. I will not read all of them to you, but if you look at accountability, it states that we will take responsibility for our commitments and maintain open, transparent, and responsive communication on academic, operational, and financial policies and outcomes. And that is something that Mr. Crawford expressed at the very beginning of this uh, presentation. Next slide, please. Let's talk about our priorities. The priorities essentially encapsulates the things that we want to see happen as major milestones for our students as they advance from pre-kindergarten through 12th grade. There are a lot of things that was considered, but ultimately we decided on what should be the focus items of the next three to five years and beyond while we implement the blueprint. The priorities capture stakeholder feedback that we received through multiple methods. And I have mentioned those methods at least two times now. Now we will review the enablers. The enablers are those structural things that support the priorities. You can see that there are four enablers and I will give you a moment to review the enablers. Next slide. So what is next in continuing our efforts to share information about the strategic plan and gain stakeholder input? Let's examine that question now. Next slide. You have already seen this picture of a winding road. So phase one is grayed out. The color that is bright is phase two. So we have talked about the priorities, we have just talked about the neighbors, but now we will discuss how we will measure them. Phase two will be released at the February 28th State Board of Education a meeting. It will let us know what indicators we believe will be needed in order for students to be successful. And then phase three will answer the question about what needs to be true in every school through programs, initiatives, and strategies. Next slide. We are going to keep the conversation going. And one of the things that we are going to continue to do is hold round tables. We are going to continue to do all of the outreach events that we are doing as well. In phase two, we are going to con continue to conduct regional gallery and data walks and that we started in Western Maryland. But we are also going to be having gallery and data walks throughout the state that will talk about, speak to, and address phase two of the strategic plan. Next slide. Everything that I have just shared with you is on a new website that we have launched. There is also a strategic planning guidebook to show everything that we have talked about. There is also an engagement report that will give you more examples about events that we have conducted and the survey that we did statewide. And now for the last slide. When time allows, please go to our website and learn more about why we selected the priorities and the enablers that we did, as well as the strategies and initiatives. And now I will turn it back over to Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford, I think you might be muted, sir. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Lawson. Uh, thank you 
for walking us through this. Uh, I think at this point, we're gonna take a look at the questions that we have. Is that right, Lindsay? Yes, yes. Okay. You're gonna um, see the questions that were asked through Slido. Um, if anyone still has some questions, please feel free to add those. Um, we can look at this live and you can upvote. If you haven't opened Slido, um, you can go ahead and open that now. The link is in your chat um, on the Zoom. And you're gonna use that again to vote on the most important priority and enabler. So go ahead and access that now while we're addressing these first few questions. Thank you. Lindsay, is it okay to jump right in then? Yes. yes. Um, Dr. Lawson, um, if you want to address any of these or pass them over to Mr. Dayhoff, um, we can go ahead and start addressing the questions that you can see on the screen. I think that Mr. Dayhoff, that we can begin with question at the very top. What is the funding source for the blueprint policy? Sure thing. So uh, the, the, the funding source for the blueprint uh, policy, I'm, I'm guessing you're talking about perhaps the college and career pathways, given, given our topic today, uh, is, is the blueprint fund. It is a special fund created in the law <laughs> associated with blueprint implementation. Uh, you know, I, I do want to note, though, that, you know, today, as we talk about MSDE's strategic plan, and the key priority here, priority four, and to making sure that students are ready for college and careers, uh, you know, there is certainly a, an important overlap for that. And uh, the blueprint policy, like I mentioned, uh, that sourced uh, the CCR said there's a whole category of state aid funding in the blueprint for uh, and associated with uh, college and careers and achieving and reaching this blueprint goal of 45% of students having an industry recognized credential or having completed the high school portion of registered apprenticeship program. And by the time the, the blueprint uh, phase in is complete. So uh, again, though, that, that work ties uh, neatly with uh, the MSTE strategic plan efforts around making sure that at the end of the day, our students are ready for college and careers. And that, uh, as you know, we, we start the conversation today, it pivots, of course, on the ability and availability of slots and spaces for children to go to when they, when they finish. And uh, again, hopefully all of those things tie in together. Thank you, Justin. And I, I see we have another question about the role of the Accountability and Implementation Board and the State Board of Education and how are they collaborating? I, you know, Mr. Crawford, I will let you speak to how they are, how the two boards are collaborating, but uh, the role of the Accountability and Implementation Board is to work with the State Board of Education and of course the state superintendent in implementing the mandates of the, of the uh, blueprint for Maryland's future. And Mr. Crawford, would you like to speak to that, sir? Sure, absolutely. I'm very pleased to speak to that. We have a very good relationship with the Accountability Board. We've had a number of ongoing conversations. Our goals are very similar. Uh, our, we're working to uh, make sure that we're not duplicating effort. We are meeting and um, it's just a very good collaboration. We had a very good meeting with them before uh, the holidays. We're planning to have additional meetings. And again, we're very focused. They're far more focused on the accountability piece, the, the, the uh, implementation accountability piece and the, the state board and the department and superintendent are far more engaged and focused on the uh, operations and the implementation policy. How do we actually do this? Uh, we are very working very closely with them. Uh, one of the things the state board has been doing is a lot of outreach. I know the accountability board has been doing that as well, but we've been going out uh, to um, meet with uh, stakeholders across the state to hear what they have to say. 
And what we're also doing is we're really trying to make sure that the things that are being asked or the things that are being done are truly things that matter, that when they're implemented will make a difference. Okay, thank you so much. And I, I see we have another question. Uh, can it be discussed how it will be determined the solutions are equitable, I guess, across the entire state? I kind of missed that. But I will say this, that the state superintendent recognizes the fact that not every local education agency is the same. And the state superintendent has been laser focused on trying to prioritize the needs of students based, across, based on different programs that he has initiated, based upon different grants that have been put into place, and based upon what we recognize through working with the different um, school systems. And Justin, if I could get you to talk about Maryland Leads, which is a nationally recognized uh, grant program that allows the school systems to select strategies within their own school system, but also um, a grant which we are looking at and making sure that this, we have results based upon the funding that we provide. Sure, and, and, and Dr. Lawson, if you're okay, I might even pivot into Maryland Works a little bit as a little Oh, teaser. absolutely. I was going to suggest uh, that, but okay. Sure, so, you know, in recognizing what, what Dr. Lawson just said, you know, absolutely, right? Every jurisdiction has their own unique needs. And uh, that corresponds to a lot of things, right? Even, even down to the types of industries, the types of colleges and careers, you know, where businesses are located and how and in what ways local education agencies are going to make sure to structure their college and career pathways to make sure those are attentive to and responsive to industry, labor market, all of which fluctuate and change over time. And those are those are important dynamics that you know we can't lose sight of because it's not a matter of saying, okay, well, what does our industry need today? What are credential needs today? Well, that's going to change as we continue to grow. So it's not just about recognizing the difference across jurisdictions, but also making sure as we implement this portion of our strategic plan that we're thinking through how that's going to be nimble and responsive to changes over time. So that what we talk about and set in place today isn't something just for today, but is a policy for tomorrow as well. Uh, and Maryland Works hopefully is one opportunity uh, to do so. And so with the blueprint and all this work upcoming, uh, we recognize the need to jumpstart a lot of that work at the local education agency level and in local industry. And so Maryland Works is a new program. The deadline for those applications is actually April 4th, so a little plug here. Um, and part of the intent of Maryland Works is to really provide and seed the infrastructure necessary so that local education agencies are well positioned moving forward to meet their college and career targets and their goals and to make sure that they are set up as a system to, for example, make sure they have flexible schedules that allow students to be attending and participating in uh, different career and college pathways, that make sure that the local education agencies have a mechanism to engage industry, to be aligned to the needs of where the job market is now and where the job market is going to make sure that the opportunities they're providing to their students again, are truly a pathway forward for those students. So um, Maryland Works is a program that's built out of state set-aside funds from the American Rescue Plan. It's a, you know, essentially kind of a, what we have left from that. Uh, and, and again, it, it's designed to really tee up that work to jumpstart uh, the efforts of local education agencies to broadly make sure that they have within their school systems the capacity to scale and launch pathways as they need to dynamically over the next several years and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. I see another question. It says, how did you arrive at the four priorities and the four enablers? And that's the one reason that I wanted to speak about how we have engaged stakeholders across the state. We listened to what our stakeholders had to say. We listened to what they felt was the needs throughout the state as far as education is concerned. That is why we talked about how many round tables we have had. That's why we talked about the data walks. That's why we have been out in, in the communities. 
And so we based our selection of our priorities on the stakeholders and then our enablers based upon nationally um, based research and evidence as to what will be effective in assisting student academic achievement, not only academic achievement, we looked at other factors as well. Uh, you know, the, the diversity in the classroom, we looked at building relationships in, in the classrooms and how that impact uh, student engagement and student learning. That's why we said that it would be very important for the teachers in the classroom to be, to be diverse. That's why we talked about providing the resources and the materials that students need. So we came up with our priorities and our enablers based on research, and based on stakeholder input, and based on the knowledge that we have here at the State Department of Education, and certainly the state superintendent who is extremely knowledgeable about national research, national best practices, and making sure that we just don't look within the state of Maryland, but we look nationwide and even worldwide as to what as to what really works in the field of education. Okay. And Lizzie, how much more time do we have for question and answer sessions? Um I let y'all go over a little bit. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> we we want to make sure we're prioritizing hearing from um you all. So um I think we need to move on to okay. um hearing um, from our stakeholders and um, Mr. Crawford will tell us about the poll that y'all are gonna take. I will um, post the Slido link again um, and then you'll introduce yourselves while you're taking the poll. Okay. Great. I wanna just, um, there's a question in there about are we working with universities? Yes, we are. And, um, it's an important um, initiative that we have working with universities. When I think about the Maryland Leads and the Maryland Works, to me, from a business standpoint, these are proof of concepts. We're able to jumpstart things like um, the science of reading. So what we'll be able to do by the fall is to be able to issue um, an update that shows where we are across the state. So from a business standpoint, we're investing a lot of money in, as we talk to the uh, ourselves, but also with the local uh, school leaders about making sure we are a good investment, that we are good value. But we're gonna now, um, gonna now ask you to introduce yourself. And in the chat, I want you to, um, rank the top priorities uh, that you'd like to talk about with respect to um, the priority or the enabler you'd like to talk about. And then after we've completed the introductions, we'll then open it up for questions and answers. We appreciate your candid feedback. And again, we're trying to get a sense, are we on track? Are we doing the right kinds of things? Are we doing the things that matter? So I'm going to um, introduce each person that will then ask you to provide your position, title, company, organization, industry. And again, thank you. Thank you so very much for taking time out of your schedule. This is evening time. Most of us would probably be home at this time. And again, thank you for that. First, we're gonna uh, introduce uh, Dr. Carr, Dr. Carr. Uh, hi, good, e good evening, and thank you for the invitation to participate in this really important work. Um, as you stated, my name is Dr. Dwight Carr. I work for the Johns Hopkins, Applied Uni Apl Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory, and I serve as the Science, Tech, Engineering, and Math Program Manager. I also serve as the Executive Director for the Maryland Math Engineering Science Achievement Program, as well as the, the Board Chair for uh, Mesa USA. So glad to be here tonight. Um, and I've put my top three in the in the Slido, and I'll also add those to the Q and A okay. in the chat. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Carr. Um, Ms. Hare. Hi there. How's everybody? 
Fine. How are you doing? <laughs> My name is Jennifer Hare. I am the Marketing and Public Relations Director for PharmaCare of Cumberland here in Cumberland, Maryland. I'm in Allegheny County up in Western Maryland. Uh, I also serve on the Education Committee for the Chamber, also serve with the local high schools and other endowment funds. Um, happy to be on here. I put my priorities in. Uh, the college and career is the big thing. So happy to talk about that this evening. Great. Thank you so much. Mr. Mortensen. Mr. Mortensen. All right, Mr. Basemore. Hey, good evening, everyone. My name is Terry Basemore Jr. and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of I3 Technologies, we're a system engineering and cybersecurity firm located proudly in Prince George's County, Maryland. Um, I put my top three in there, but they keep changing as I hear you guys talk. It's some pretty good uh, <laughs> information that you're, you're providing, which uh, I can't figure out which one I want to be my top. But um, I think I'm gonna stick with what I put in there so far. So okay. it's not there. But I'm a pleasure to be here, and I can't wait to hear from everyone tonight. Thank you so much. Um, Ms. Contreras? Good evening, everyone. I'm Maya Contreras. Um, I'm part of Brown Advisory, which is an investment management firm based out of Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I'm a native of Maryland, went through the Maryland education system, so I have a really good sense of what you all are trying to do and appreciate the work that you're putting into this as well. Um, I work at Brown Advisory as the head of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I also come from like, many years of recruiting, and particularly recruiting for students in the Maryland and across other regions as well, but particularly Maryland as well. Um, for me, like uh, my colleagues here on the on the call, there probably are going to be misarrangements of other ways I could prioritize this, but I think first and foremost is ready, the priority three, ready for high school. Um, we do a lot of obviously college hiring, but we're, what we're seeing the biggest gap is really starting from high school, just the awareness and particularly the diversity or lack thereof in the financial services sector. Happy to talk, of, talk about that more. Great, thank you so much. Mr. Godfrey. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Frank Godfrey III. I am also work at Brown Advisory in Baltimore with Maya. Um, I'm an investment research analyst and the head of the internship program uh, here at the firm, also a native of Maryland, um, came through the Maryland private school education system, and uh, I'm involved in the Young Alumni Association at Bishop McNamara High School, the Alumni Council at Keenan Flagler Business School, as well as the uh, uh, vice president of the Alumni Association for the Institute for Responsible Citizenship. Um, the three that I chose was similar to what others have said already. So ready for college and career, um, educator preparation, diversity and quality, and then ready for um, our high quality instruction materials. I think still at the core of it, being able to write, read and do high end math and, and being able to convey ideas in a very succinct way is still something we value at, at a very high level um, for intern programs. And then just being able to kind of bridge the gap between walking out of the door of high school and, and the readiness that is uh, important to succeed in college and make it through the four years, but also to hopefully further that education and bring that um, balance and benefit towards that wherever they choose to take their career from there. So thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Klein. Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Courtney Klein. I am the Workforce Development Specialist at Frederick Health in Frederick, Maryland. Um, my number one priority right now is ready for college and career. I've been working closely with FCPS as well as FCC and all of their CTE programs and just trying to find a way to better pipeline in individuals after they have had some sort of training, whether that be in high school or dual enrollment with FCC. So really looking forward to that discussion of how we can really create more of a push system in our state of Maryland instead of a pool system when it comes to finding um, individuals to hire. Excellent, thank you so very much. Miss um, Wainwright. Miss Wainwright, yes. Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself. <laughs> Um, I'm Georgetta Lazar Wainwright. I'm with Delaware Elevator. I'm the safety and training administrator and coordinator 
Uh, we have a four-year apprenticeship program, and we just started in 2021 with a youth apprenticeship program, and uh, we are excited to see that uh, on top of college, you guys emphasize the career ready. So the apprenticeship is something that we're very interested in, and the pathways uh, from high school into the apprenticeship is something that we're definitely having our eyes on. Great, thank you very much. You. Mr. Ridge? Yes, um, I'm Mike Ridge. I'm the president of Clarity Cyber. Um, we have two youth apprentices. Uh, who are uh, doing a bunch of cybersecurity work on a government contract right now. Uh, we have uh, uh, one intern and uh, uh, they're actually part-time, the Youth Apprentice Program provided more hours for the, uh, uh, for the high school students than, than the intern got. Uh, now that said, I'm struggling with the ratings and I'm struggling with the ratings because, well, the in the priorities, these are at different periods in a student's career. And I'm I'm trying to figure out how to say one is more important than the other. Ready for kindergarten? <laughs> well, there's different people that are working that than than ready for college and career. And I I don't understand why we can't prioritize all of all four of these. Uh, priorities. The, the equities issues are different at each one. The, the, there's a whole bunch of different things going on there. But in my opinion, we need to be able to do all of these. Um, and in the enablers, uh, this is motherhood and apple pie here. <laughs> these, are, these are all things that, that I, nobody's going to say that, that uh, something here is, is not, well, we can, we can downgrade on that one. These are all things that we'll need to strive to make sure that we do have high quality materials. We, we do have uh, a social, emotional learning, health, wellness, and safety. We, you know, th these are, these are uh, the things that are going to make the schools better. Um, so I, I'm struggling with the priorities. I really am. Um, I'm not an educator, though, uh, so um, the the work that I do is is uh, can be rather technical, and I can tell you what would make a good employee, and I can tell you the skills that they need after after college. I can tell you the skills that they would likely demonstrate in high school, um, but when you get down to the middle school level some of the, the same skills that my engineers would need would be the same that maybe a librarian would need, okay? So I don't know uh, how to tell you how to uh, uh, get a kindergartner ready for cybersecurity, but, but, but we, can get, we can certainly trace skills and things like that, but I don't, I don't know exactly how to do that. Oh, I think you're right on track. We are... Uh... The challenge that we have with this um, transformation is that we know from the research, the earlier you start, the better off you are. So whether it's getting kids ready for kindergarten, but we have a whole bunch of kids that have gone well past kindergarten. <laughs> so we're not gonna write them off as well. So okay. what we're trying to do in an orderly fashion is to take the meet the children where they are today and assist them. Over time, what we're what we want to be able to see, just like in business, is we want to end the rework. That if we do the right things with the children in kindergarten, third grade, that some of the issues that we're dealing with now with children in, in middle school or high school many of those we hope for, will be gone. So we're trying to do that. And I think talking to us about what you need, talk to us about your skills and what you're looking for in the way of, of employees, that'll help us then as we think back how to build that into our systems. But I think you're right on track, uh, Mr. Ridge. I'd like to turn now to um, Mr. Diaz.
Um, Ms. Myers. Hi, good evening. Thanks for the opportunity here. I am Mary Kay Myers. I'm the finance director at the Patuxent Partnership. The partnership brings industry, government, and academia together. We're in um, Lexington Park, St. Mary's County. We have a, a youth apprenticeship program uh, through the Maryland Apprenticeship Program. It's called Tech Jobs Rule. Um, it's a partnership between Dr. James A. Forrest Center here in St. Mary's County Public Schools, the Patuxent Partnership, which is us, and the Strategic Education Office of um, the Naval Air Warfare Center Aircraft Division here at Pax River. So we've been very successful in getting apprentices out to the community to fill those skilled artisan and technicians that are greatly needed down here. Sounds Thank good. You. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm gonna to try to get this right. Please forgive me if I don't. Ms. Aguamoli. That's good. <laughs> Thank you very much. And i um, glad to be here. And one of the benefits of going towards the end is I get to listen to everyone's um, ideas and <laughs> I change mine along the way. Uh, and, you know, like with everyone else, um, it's been a little bit difficult. So my name is Eberichi Uguamole. I'm president and CEO of Captiva Solutions. We're also a cybersecurity um, company but more in the training space, um, training, regulatory compliance and uh, assessments. Um, in terms of priorities and enablers, um, I think it starts with um, and the educators. Everyone here can remember a favorite teacher, a favorite uh, coach or someone that made them feel special, um, whether it's from kindergarten or um, middle school, high school, or even college. So I think it always starts with the educators and then um, second to that would be high quality instruction materials. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Um, and again, happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Mr. Mullen. Mr. Mullen. Okay. Have I missed anyone? Yes, please. So I'm extremely appreciative to be here tonight. My name is Todd Eckley. I am the organizer and recruiter for UA Local 486. That is the plumbers and steam fitters of Baltimore, Maryland. Um, we have an apprenticeship program. We have three schools in our jurisdiction, um, Baltimore, Hagerstown, and Seaford, Delaware. Um, our jurisdiction covers most of the state. We have the first three counties in West Virginia, but we have pretty much the rest of the state from Hagerstown over. We stop at Prince George's and Montgomery County and have half Anne Arundel. So the Eastern shore is ours and across Baltimore. I try to cover it all as an organizer. It's a huge ground. Um, we are looking to become more diverse. The areas that we work in, we want our um, workers to look more like the communities that they're from. We are trying extremely hard to get more women in the trade. Uh, they're half the population of the world, and we see um, uh, a need to have them actually, you know, get into our apprenticeship and work for our contractors. We have 112 contractors. A um, couple people had mentioned, um, you know, technician jobs and stuff like that. We we have HVAC technicians right now. They're um, the biggest need that I try to fill for our contractors. So me personally, I um, I got appointed to our JTC committee. Um, I give presentations, I go to career fairs. If any of the schools would be interested in having people from our training school or myself come by and talk to the students, I think it's extremely important to have options. I think a lot of kids in high school don't realize how many types of jobs that there are truly out there. Um, I was a steam fitter by trade. I worked in the field for 24 and a half years and now I'm the organizer of my local. But um, what's important to us, math. Uh, it, it's kind of funny how many students come out and they don't, you know, know fractions or how to read a rule. Um, if you do pick our side of the trade, it's, it's going to be pretty important later on because we deal with some trigonometry and a lot of math for our pipe fitting side. Um, and with the infrastructure coming up and the infrastructure bill, um, it's going to be extremely important to have more young people get into the trades. And some of these careers are, you know, paying 100 grand a year plus. 
And uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be on here with everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you. And I apologize for, for missing. I went back and looked at my notes and I realized it was my mistake. So my apologies. We're now going to turn to the uh, take a look at the polling. As we get ready to do that, just again, we're going to ask some open-ended questions and we're very much interested in your comments. Um, you can also stick your comments in the chat. Uh, if you're not speaking, we ask that you mute yourselves. And here are the priorities. Lindsay, were you going to say anything about that? Is it come out okay. about what you expected? Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, it looks like the um, group ranked priority four, ready for college and career, the highest. Um, so we will focus on that topic for our questions. And I think um, you all naturally in your introductions answered question one. So we can... Um, explore priority four and skip to question two and dig into the challenges. Um, and so we just wanted to let you see what the top three um, priorities and enablers were that you ranked, but we're just gonna focus on the first one um, with the remainder of our time. Thank you, Mr. Crawford. Thank you. So with that being said, we're the question we have here is, uh, what are the challenges do you think may come up as we prepare students for college and career? So please just indicate or uh, if you uh, any thoughts or comments around that, I will recognize you. Look forward to hearing what you have to say. Ms. Klein, and then uh, Dr. Carr. I think one of the big challenges that we're going to see with students in Maryland is being able to prepare them for careers, especially directly out of high school. I think there's such a large volume of children that will take advantage of these opportunities, specifically CTEs and CTC centers. And I know just speaking from what's happening in Frederick County, they have to turn away so many students just because of space. Um, so I think as these workforce gaps continue to widen as the years go on, it's going to be really hard to keep up with what the workforce needs are with the same amount of students coming out of high school and CTEs prepared to do jobs right out of high school. Absolutely. And I think the blueprint says that the goal is over time, is it Dr. Lawson, it's about that about 50% of the graduating students would be going into careers. That would be a significant increase in, in terms of children that are in apprenticeship and uh, CTE type programs over where we are today. Yes, absolutely. Dr. Carr. Yes, yeah, so I guess my question is more around um, this part where I think it's a fantastic priority um, I think the devil is always in the details when you figure out how are you going to do it. So the, the key part that I think is will be important to unpack and really be detailed about is when we say what an individualized plan is for to, for college career and life to, to be to, to succeed in those things. Um, I think it's, again, phenomenal to do that. It's just um, how do you go about creating the plan and creating the plan it, itself isn't enough you have to create the plan. Um, work with the kid, work, work, work with the student individually on the plan, monitor the plan, and then have the support in place to make sure that plan gets implemented and that they're supported. And when you're talking about the number of students in our school system and the people who will be responsible for helping to guide a student along that plan, that part is the one where I get a little hung up and I say, hey, how are we going to do that? So I was wondering if you had any um, if they're, and I understand that each school district's coming up with their own plans on how they're gonna accomplish the blueprint, but I was wondering if you had any insights to help us understand that as a group today. I'll start, I'll have Dr. Lawson chime in. You've said a very important thing, and that is to me, is there gonna be fidelity in the execution of the various initiatives? 
And that's, that's really what it comes down to. So what we're doing, there are two things that we're doing. Number one is that we're placing a premium on proven research-based solutions. That's number one. So you have to use one of those. Because I've been in this long enough where in the early days that sit on the state board and we'd look at the results and the results were declining or whatever. And you'd ask, well, they're using uh, proven methodologies. Well, what's happening? What's going on then? So we're, we're now going to be far more rigorous with that. Secondly, we're going to be far more rigorous in terms of the fidelity, the actual execution of the various initiatives to make sure that we follow through and we do those with fidelity. Dr. Lawson. Yeah, I was going to also say you, you hit on something um, that is quite important, Dr. Carl, on the fact that different local education agencies will have different methods and strategies in order to make sure each student has an, an individual plan. And of course, it is going to mean bringing on, uh, you know, more counselors, it, uh, people who are going to be highly invested in making sure that they have a, a concrete understanding of careers that are available to students when they are leaving high school. So I don't think it is like we said before, a one size fits all, but I think it will be important as Mr. Crawford said, for us to uh, look at the plans that are implemented. To, it is going to take us being actively engaged and in going into the school systems and looking at some of the things they have in place. And more importantly than that, from being a high school principal, it's going to take parental involvement and it's going to take uh, the school system being able to get the parents involved in the future of their, of their children as well. We also have the, the teams that will be going in and assisting and monitoring. Can you say a word about that? You know, um, that's what I was saying. That's why I was saying it would take us going into the school systems and actually monitoring and making sure that they are um, meeting with the students and helping the students to develop their plans. And, you know, we need to look at what happens beyond high school as well, making sure that we follow those students for a given period of time to see if they are successful in the career path that they have selected. And that will give us an idea, too, of how we can further assist them. Ms. Myers. Thank you. So um, again, I'm in St. Mary's County. We have started our youth apprenticeship program in the Forest Tech Center um, and find that part of the, being the CTE pathway. It's been successful with the students that we've been able to place. Again, starting small so we can be successful. Um, we've ran into a few challenges and, and I think that we'll continue as we look more, but finding enough um, uh, staffing to assist with the roles of the getting the students out and career ready um, and also adapting students schedules uh, to make sure that by when they are senior they are required to take English and math at least and whatever else they might have missed so making sure that there's enough uh, wherewithal to go across those students will be difficult across the county I think. Excellent, excellent. Any other? I'm going to come up. Yes, please. Because my race, please. Working. That's all right. That's um, all right. <laughs> um, but I did want to ask: when it comes to the challenge, I've noticed most of our college um, students wanting to take a gap year right after graduating, and we're realizing a lot of that is just because they're burnt out mentally, just emotionally. And so part of that challenge, they obviously have spent four years now, four plus years maybe, learning and, and kind of being exposed to really great opportunities. And by the time they complete their gap year, a lot has shifted. Um, and so I, I have found that those who did not take a gap year and have continued to go through their college education, it seems like there's a component of having some mixture of maybe a co-op experience where they're doing half of a semester working, half a semester going to school has kept them engaged throughout their early career, their cycle. And so the, 
that that's some, potentially a challenge because I'm seeing more um, graduates wanting to do a gap year. And I guess the question is just how do we keep them engaged um, well enough to want to continue working in that professional field right after college? Absolutely. And as you know, the, the new governor, one of his new initiatives that's working its way through the legislature right now is that year of, of public service after completion of high school to allow students to be able to do what you're talking about doing. So we'll be monitoring, we're supportive of that. We're monitoring its progress through um, the legislature. I know it's a top priority, so I think he's hoping that he'll be able to get that through the legislature this session, and then we'll be able to actually implement. I'm gonna turn now to Ms. Agumoli, and then Dr. Carr, if you have an additional comment, please. Yes. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, so in my opinion, I think um, we're facing, especially in the STEM um, industries, we're facing um, a lot of challenges with competing um, industries. So um, a lot of uh, college, high school, college students may not look at STEM careers as being interesting, engaging, profitable, you know. Um, there's a lot of uh, influx of things on social media that draw their attention and attract them away from maybe the more traditional roles. Um, so I think in, you know, for some of those STEM careers, we have to find a way to possibly make them more interesting, make them more engaging, show that there's value in um, those uh, careers, um, you know, ramping up the interest factor so that the, the students or the, the, the children can get more interested in those careers. I think that's um, one of the bigger challenges we face um, today. Yes, making it more interesting. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Dr. Carr, did you have an additional comment? I did, thank you uh, for, for, for the, allowing me to ask another question here. The, so, um, so the Applied Physics Lab hosts over 350 high school intern students every year. Uh, one of our biggest challenges is transportation. And those students come from a number of counties throughout our state. So my question is, you know, if we're looking at um, making sure students are college and career ready, one of the things that students say when they go off to college that are attributed to which major they chose and them choosing a career is their participation in an internship. So one of the challenges that I see um, is without, you know, without providing a way for transportation to be covered or some kind of infrastructure for students to get to different places around the state that do allow for internships, um, it would be very difficult for, for us to achieve this goal uh, without providing that kind of support for our high school students, especially those who don't have cars or have don't have uh, access to uh, good, good transportation. Absolutely. Agree with you 100. percent Mr. Dale, are you familiar with anything that's uh, that's currently being considered with respect to providing some of those that wraparound support or availability of funds in that regard? You are muted. Can... Okay, you were... you're still muted. Mr. Crawford, while we're waiting for um, Mr. Dayhoff to um, answer that question, I just want to suggest we address um, the next two questions yeah. together um, because we've only got about like 10, 12 minutes left. Okay, sounds good. Thank you much. Thank Lynn. You. Okay, uh, what supports or strategies will be needed to prepare children, uh, students for success in their careers? And what does success um, really look like when we step back from this and we say this, whether we've been successful or not? Mr. Uh, Bazemore? Raise my hand by accident, but I'll go ahead and uh, <laughs> no, okay. answer. Right. It, it, it is what I wanted to answer. <laughs> That's great. 
Um, so quickly, um, one of the things that I think for support um, that may be overlooked or people may know about it are the workforce development boards within each of the different counties. Um, so like in Prince George's County, uh, Employee Prince George's does an amazing job at providing a lot of internships, mentorships, and other career coaching opportunities to individuals there. Um, we partner with them. We've had probably, I think, I think about 12 interns that have come from there. And a lot of the internships are paid for, um, which is great by the development board. As far as, um, I'll say, the uh, strategies, uh, working with the American Job Centers in each county, as well as having or participating with tech councils, um, industry involvement of what the industry is looking for in real time. So having them actually come into schools and talk about in real time what's actually needed. Because a lot of times we hear, oh, we need some antiquated cert or something else that is now out of date. And really the industry has moved or shifted to a different place. And people are still getting kids geared and ready to go towards something that may not be as in demand as it was once before. Um, and so what is success like? I'm still trying to figure that out. I mean, I think we can try to say that unemployment will be a good determination of success, but I think it's more important to get people into careers and not just jobs. And I think that'll be important for this aspect is to have the more nuanced details of what actually means when people are not facing unemployment. Are they actually happy? Are they actually in career? Is this a part of their career goal or plan that they had? Do they have a career goal or plan? I think all those need to be um, addressed in part of that. Thank you, Mr. Godfrey and then Mr. Eckley. Uh, I can jump in it, and I know Mr. Uh, Baysmore, his mic was going in and out a bit, so I hope that I'll repeat a couple of things he said. But um, I will say, so utilizing our Maryland kind of base businesses, I mean, everyone in this room has uh, an organization that's based in Maryland and would love to see a way for us to engage with high schools, either have internship or externship, shadowing, treks. I mean, I think about ways that I engaged when I was um, in, in school in Maryland, and just the easiest way was just to find a person that you knew in the company and, and kind of get a in-depth conversation to some of the points that have been made tonight of just expanding the aperture of what is available. Like most people will see, okay, you know, you can go into these type of industries and the entire rest of the world is not necessarily um, privy to them and, and others have the fortune of seeing what how wide it is pretty early. But I think opening that aperture early, finding their niche, again, to, to Mr. Bazemore's point, finding that career and, and what kind of speaks to them pretty early is, is something I think is going to be crucial here. And then I think a, another point I will put in that same category is just mentorship and sponsorship. It's something that comes up a ton in careers. It's something that comes up a ton in college. And, and I don't think that it's um, I don't think it's not necessary to have it in, in a high school level. I mean, I, I remember speaking pretty early in college of just the, the kind of monkeys in a barrel idea of just always bringing up somebody. Whenever you pull the monkey out of the uh, old game, you would have a couple of monkeys attached to it. And the, the best way for us to continue to push the lever and push the, the bar here in Maryland is to say, like, hey, clearly the people who have come through the school system and have gone on to be successful um, can reach back and kind of dip into that pool and, and provide these opportunities and lenses for these students. Um, your more difficult question here of what success looks like, I think there's going to be a lot of different lenses to, to kind of put that together and, and putting that uh, how to measure it is probably the most challenging part here. But one thing that I think should be in consideration is just like, the, the success, higher percent completion through high school, going on to completing college or trade school and that percentage increasing over time, uh, as well as more specifically, diverse students in completion of high school, completion of um, university and going on to, to have kind of hopefully increased um, GPA averages and et cetera. I think these are things that are easily identified as metrics of what are those numbers currently? What are they five, 10, 25 years from now? Um, and I know, to some of the points that were made, you know, career is much more than just the job that we do every day. It's the balance of life and, and what you're able to give to your communities and et cetera. And those are also things that I think should be as a part of the plan. Thank you so very much. Ms. Mr. Eckley, then Ms. Hare and Ms. Contreras. Yes, yeah, so, uh, you know, I'm 47 years old. My generation was go to college, go to college, go to college. Um, I'm actually a college dropout. I was working in the winter and the summers um, as a steam fitter, working non-union, and um, wound up falling in love with it. The guys around, around me were making a lot of money for construction workers because people like the group of send of people slapping tar on the road. And these jobs are actually pretty high paying. But um, I wound up getting in my local union in 06 and uh, realized that it, it was not just a job, it's a career. Um, I would, I guess, advocate for the rest of the unions across the country, the electricians, the sheet metal workers, the iron workers. Um, you know, we all have apprenticeship programs, school's free, two nights a week, um, come out with certifications and licenses. And believe it or not, 
I would say 80% of the business owners uh, for our signatory contractors were once, appre- were once apprentices in our apprenticeship program. Um, there's also other avenues with us. I mean, I never thought I'd be on the political side of my local, but I mean, there's uh, business agents, business manager. And like I said, a lot of these, um, you know, young people start their own businesses. They get out of the apprenticeship about two years, uh, two years or so, they get their master's license so they can pull permits. And next thing you know, they're um, running a business and the apprentices around them, they um, pull them in as their brothers and sisters. And uh, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm advocating labor more than anything right now. So I apologize. But um, like I said, I just more options for these students and don't be afraid to reach out to your locals, your other locals across the country. So thank you. Absolutely. When we were in Western Maryland, Washington County, um, one of the things that they were doing with their apprenticeship programs was that they were building in a entrepreneurship business management component with the idea that at some point the students would want to go off and perhaps start their own businesses. So again, they were forward looking and helping to prepare the young folks for the future. So we have Ms. Hare, Ms. Contreras, Dr. Carr, and then Ms. Klein. Yeah, the one thing I just wanted to mention was we all are very happy when students in high school decide what they want to do. They're happy they either take the biomedical path or they're going into, they want to go out to our career centers and so forth. But what are we going to do about the students who have no idea what they want to do? They're picking their classes as they're going through the four years of, co- of high school and they don't know. We can't ignore them. What are what are our plans for them? How do we expose them to things? You know, we always talk when we talk to students, we say, let's talk about the things you don't like. At least that kind of helps pull some things out of the equation. But how do we get them excited and try to help them see all the opportunities that are out there? I think that's a challenge because we're so focused on trying to get them to make a decision and make a decision early. So I just think that's something we need to be mindful of. Absolutely, agree with you 100%. Thanks. Thank you very much. Ms. Contreras? Yeah, thank you. That's actually a great segue, uh, Ms. Hare, because what I was gonna share was, even though it fell very low at the bottom of the poll, um, there's a sense of students really need to feel like they belong or feel like they're, they're being empowered. And it's ironically enough, a big factor that discounts them from getting a job when they just don't feel like they belong at the table, that they belong in that field. So it, even though it's a soft skill, something that they have to learn, um, it's an absolutely necessary skill that could be very well taught in school, in ele- elementary middle or high school, but to give them the sense that their voice matters so that they know when to speak up and know how to fit into an organization, regardless of what they look like in their own educational background. Um, But I do feel like success for me is even if they find that they're in the wrong field, they know how to speak up and ask for help or ask to move into a a different opportunity that is more aligned with their own interests and passion. Absolutely. And I think the other reality is that I've experienced in myself, I'm 71. I've had to reinvent myself seven, several different times. So part of the education process is helping children be able to reinvent themselves multiple times throughout a career uh, to be relevant and to find the satisfaction that they're looking for. Absolutely. Dr. Carr? Mr. Crawford, that was, those are along the lines of what I was about to say. I think that 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 piece of paper, once they graduate high school, has to represent the ability to fulfill their dreams, regardless of what that is, um, whether it's their dreams for, because ultimately college and career should lead to them making an impact or making some contribution to society so that they can fulfill their goals and their dreams for their life. And being adaptable, I think, is an important part of that, because as you mentioned, many of us you know, are not in the same career we were in when we first graduated college or whenever we got out of high school. The second part, from a business standpoint, what I think success would look like is when they show up on my doorstep, that they are ready to help make a contribution, work as a team member, help us solve problems critically. Um, and then that that piece of paper represents a set of foundational knowledge that we all, we can then build upon. Because once they get here, we will also pay for a college degree. We'll pay for a master's degree. But we need to know that when they walk, walk in our doors, 
that they are ready to work and ready to work as a team and that they are hungry to learn. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Ms. Klein. Just to echo what um, a lot of individuals were saying, I think a lot of it does come down to getting in touch with the parents at an early stage in children's lives to let them know that, again, to echo what Mr. Eckley said, my generation too, you go to college. If you say you're going to a community college, you're looked at a little bit differently. If you say you're going into a trade, you're looked at a little bit differently. And I think we're at that point right now with having those conversations with the parents of the children to say, it is a viable career to be a plumber. It is a viable career to be an electrician or a steam fitter or whatever it is. And they don't have to go to school for four years or even two years to get into an industry and learn what they like, what they don't like, be able to reinvent themselves if they don't like something, but really kind of take away that stigma that's associated with a not knowing what you want to do. So if you, if you don't know what you want to do, do an apprenticeship. The worst that can happen is you do it for a little bit and you find out you hate it, yeah. right? No <laughs> harm, no foul. So really having the conversations with not only the students, but those parents to say, it's okay that your kid wants to work with their hands. It's okay if your kid doesn't know what they want to do, but here are some jobs, here are some trades, here are some companies that are willing to work with your child to figure out what is going to bring them joy, what is going to be successful for them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Excellent comments. Mr. Eckley, did you have additional comment? Just want to make sure. Okay, just to, I think we're nearing the end. I want to just at this point, I want to just thank everyone. You've given us some very good information, some very good things to think about. My sense is from the comments that uh, we're still at the very beginning. But my sense is that um, I think the consensus is that we're headed in the right track. We're sort of on the right track. We've got things we have to do. We are, there are still a lot of questions we have to work through, a lot of details we have to work out. But directionally, my sense is from this conversation is that we are headed in the right direction. We've got a ton of things to do. We would encourage you to continue to stay close and help us provide comments. If you see that we're starting to drift off track, say something. We encourage you to say something. You're not going to hurt our feelings because at the end of the day, our goal is a simple one. Provide our students with the best possible opportunities for a lifetime. So help us, hold us accountable. If you don't see the result that you expect, Say something, say something, hold us accountable. And we do appreciate it. We appreciate you taking time out of your schedule on a Thursday evening to spend time with us. And again, uh, the superintendent, he would love to have been here. He is being slammed by budget hearings. He called me, he's been in hearings, multiple hearings, sometimes multiple hearings during the day. He called me this morning. At about nine o'clock, he was in between hearings. He's getting ready to go back into hearings. I think he's got hearings all the rest of the week and I think first part of next week. So he's had almost two weeks of hearings just about every day, sometimes multiple hearings a day. But he wanted me to let you know that he'll be watching the, um, the YouTube and he wanted you to know that he appreciates you taking uh, time out of your schedule to do this. And we do on behalf of the state board and the department. Again, thank you so much for everything that you do in helping provide opportunities for our young people and for our uh, residents. Lindsay, is there anything else that we need to do? Um, I think we just wanna hear from um, Dr. Lawson and Mr. Dayhoff to see Excellent. if they have any other um, closing remarks. I would love to encourage each of the um, participants tonight to um, take our strategic planning survey. Um, I'll put the link to that and where you can also find more information about the strategic plan and engagement report in the chats. 
Um, and feel free to share that survey with um, your networks. The more feedback we have from as many Marylanders as possible, the better our plan will be. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Thank Law. you. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Mr. Crawford, we could not end tonight without thanking you for um, sharing your ideas and your thoughts and leading this discussion. Certainly, I know how hard you work for on behalf of the children in the state of Maryland, and I want you to know that it is very much appreciated. I um, know that Mr. Chaudhary knew that he was leaving this discussion in good hands when he selected you to be here, so thank you so much. Mr. Dayhoff uh, did send me a text. He could not, un he had t technical difficulties and could not unmute himself. I wish I could learn that trick for future meetings with Mr. <laughs> Dayhoff, but <laughs> certainly. And I could not leave tonight without thanking all of our participants. It was a rich and full discussion. And certainly you have a wealth of knowledge that is truly valued by everyone here at the State Department of Education as well as the State Board of Education. So thank you so much for your particip participation. It was very much appreciated. And Lindsay, thank you and, your, and thank you and everyone else that helped make this uh, program tonight a success. Thank you Absolutely. so much. Nicely done, thank you. Thank you everyone, have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.